going to be a little bit of a different video than I'm normally doing. As you can probably already guess, we're going to speak rather than put text on the screen. Because that's a pain to follow and a pain to do. So let's get to it. My first computer was a Pentium 150 non-MMX. Uh, had an Ensonic Soundscape sound card, 32 megs of EDO RAM, 150 megabyte hard drive. Really, really low end. I remember getting, <clears throat> we got back from the store after buying it, and I, we didn't even have internet back then. And <laughs> it was really kind of a, a, a struggle to keep it relevant and, and playing games. I remember it couldn't play Unreal the original Unreal very well at all, and I spent hours and hours in front of that screen running the time demo loop, uh, the, the castle flyby, just trying to get it to 30 FPS. Even after sticking a voodoo card in there, I don't think I ever reached the 30 FPS. But maybe we'll be able to do with this. The parts I've selected for this build aren't the best of the best, but basically they hit all the bases I wanted with this retro build. The motherboard, I believe, is an OEM from an old uh, Gateway 2000, <clears throat> but it does have USB 1.0 and a decent onboard graphics card, the ATI Rage 2. As for the sound card, I wanted Soundbaster co compatible. Uh, it's a Vibra 16 CT2260. Um, this particular one, I believe, was also from some OEM, as it's very cut down. Most of the options on it are missing. It's only got uh, line in, line out, and mic in. I don't think it's going to focus. But what it does have is an OPL3 chip, which is fantastic for DOS gaming, which is primarily what this build is going to be for. The CPU we're going with, Pentium 233 MMX, simply because I have my choice of nearly all the Pentiums in plastic and ceramic. And this is, this group of processor here is the main reason I'm doing this build. I saw it on Craigslist for you know, the whole bundle for like $30. And I contacted the owner and he's like, I just want to get rid of them. If you give me 10 bucks, they're all yours. So I've got 10 processors ranging from the Pentium, you know, non MMX 100 all the way to the 233 MMX. Uh, there's a few uh, duplicates in here, a few 150s. I don't have a 166, but we've got the Pentium MMX 200 and then non MMX 200 and then on the way up all the way to 233. The board supports PC 133 SD RAM. Uh, 256 megs is the most, so we're going to stick 228 meg sticks into it. And then for the hard drive, we're going to do the pretty standard by now, CF card to IDE. And we're going to shove it all into this rather handsome looking beige box. A lot of cases from this era are not standard. They're not like what you would see nowadays with side panels that come off and thumblet or toolless uh, teardown and all that. Um, but the one really cool thing that they had was that a lot of times the motherboard tray came out, which was very convenient for putting all the guts into it and taking it out because with the way they're built, everything gets in the way of everything and it's not real user friendly. This wasn't my first choice for the case, but it, it hit most of the boxes I wanted, most of the check boxes. And I think it's gonna be a real great choice for this. Here's the handle for removing the case or the motherboard tray. 
Oh, I got a screw in there. But they put a screw in there, so. Yes. So that's going to make putting this together really easy. Well, easy-ish. Back in the early days, a lot of things weren't standardized yet, and I guess this is one thing that at least whoever made this uh, motherboard tray, or rather uh, computer case, they hadn't bought onto the whole standard motherboard standoff thing yet. No big deal, but I don't have any of these laying around, so we're going to have to make do with just six points rather than the nine that most ATX motherboards use. It also uses these goofy little stamp steel PCI, expan <clears throat> PCI expansion port blanks. I don't like these at all, so we're going to get rid of these. I have a bunch of these laying around from other builds and uh, scavenge cases, but they don't match. That's not a big deal because you're not looking at the back of the computer. But... Um, some of them have proprietary little hooks on the end. It kind of sucks. I'll have to dremel those off. Well, it also uses... I don't know what these are for, but I hate them. Are they grounds? Do they make sure it, it's actually touching metal? I don't know. But they get messed up over the years. You can bend them back or remove them. I've never had a problem removing them, so we're probably going to see if we can do that. Oh yeah, they just got these little tabs here that you can bend off with your fingernail. And pop right off. That wasn't in shot. I apologize. Just like that, a little weight reduction. Now the computer is going to be faster. So before I put the motherboard in, I'm noticing the stock I.O. plate, all of the input and outputs line up on the new motherboard. Minus, of course, the onboard sound, as we don't have that. And I don't know if that's coincidence or, or what, or if maybe they had standardized layout back then. But it's lucky for me. Let's keep going. There's a couple of motherboard stands up in here with raised necks on them that fit up into these holes for the screws and one of them's not lining up very well. I fixed it. Evidently the answer was to push harder. Works well for picking stuff up. Sometimes my meat claws can't fit into small places. So like I said earlier, we're going to max this board out. Uh, 233 MMX is... As far as I know, the fastest Pentium you can put in this board. And even like the new Ryzen's, all you do is line up the one corner that's different to the one marked the same on the socket 7. Pretty simple. And then the board supports up to 256 megs. It just sounds weird. 256 megs of SD RAM for the days of DDR. But it installs exactly the same. Line it up in the hole. 
press down, down click. Putting a CPU cooler on an older socket, such as the socket 7 here, can be a little tricky sometimes because they're not symmetrical. There isn't upwards or downwards or whichever. In this case, oh, this raised portion here has to be on this side here for it to line up. I don't know if you can actually install it the other way um, without bending anything, but uh, wow, that's really zoomed in. Anyways, here we go. So I'm trying to put this particular cooler on here and every time I get this side on, this side gets stuck up. The crossbar in there keeps getting hooked up on top of the fins on the cooler. So that's something to look out for if you get this particular one. I've never run into this on any others. So I've, I've built a few computers like this, you know, years ago, but I don't remember ever having this much trouble. I'll be back. Well, that was an absolute nightmare. To get that end on, you have to hold the whole cooler up at an extreme angle to get that clip in. All while holding this side down and away from the top of these fins or else it would get hooked up on there. And once the tension from this side uh, was holding, it was very difficult, at least I couldn't figure out how to do it, to get it to come down off of those, the top of those uh, fins there. So, but we got it done. So our sound card isn't a plug and play card, which means you have to set up your interrupts, IRQs, DMAs, um, with these jumpers here. Isn't that really easy to see? But basically from the factory, this is set up with your standard ones. 220, 155. Um, it, it, it's very bog standard, so it should, it should just work. I shouldn't have to change into the interrupts or DMAs. So let's stick it in. I'm going to put it at the bottom, keep it out of the way of things. I say slots are way stronger, or tougher rather, to insert into than PCIs. I don't know why, but it's just the way they are. Now I don't have a video card to put in here as it's built into the motherboard. Like I said, it's the ATI Rage 2, and it should do all right. Uh, my type of, um, Retro gaming is going to include uh, Duke Nukem 3D, The Dig, um, of course your Dooms, Heretics, you know, a lot of the first person shooters. Uh, on top of that, um, some of the newer titles, not really, eh, I guess you can consider your Unreal's uh, retro. Um, but I would like to upgrade to a better graphic card. Um, maybe sometime down the law line. Get like a Voodoo One, uh, maybe a Voodoo, they're very expensive cards. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, a lot of this depends on a budget, for sure. After a quick once over, uh, checking all the jumpers, and it turns out this was already set up for a 233 uh, MMX. <clears throat> it's time to stuff this into the case. Now, with the way these were built and the crazy slots and tabs and everything you got to line it up into. 
I imagine this isn't going to be easy to do. They, they usually weren't. But we'll see what we can do. So I figured out the problem. That little nut right there on the back of the uh, sound card is running into that metal plate there. Well, that's awesome. Here's something they hadn't quite figured out or standardized by this point in time. The power switch, the power LED, two wires are next to each other. Right down in here, the power LED connector, they're separated. Not a big deal, as you can just repin the plug. But I guess that's why nowadays most of your power LEDs are two separate um, single pin plugs. The power supply that I'm going to be using is actually the one that I swapped out of that old compact Presario. Actually, yeah, it was a Presario uh, that I did that deep clean on. friend gave me that was sitting around in his garage it's a 250 watt power supply but that should be more than enough for this system so I have not yet even tried to boot this motherboard up yet I probably should have before I went through the trouble of sticking it in the case and hooking it up to power and you know all that so let's see if it turns on. I hear a fan whirring. Hey, look at that. Yeah, Gateway 2000. Do I get all 256 megs of RAM? We do. Yes. What the BIOS looks like. I have not hooked up a. <laughs> I have not hooked up a keyboard. But it boots up. Oh, I don't have my LED light hooked up right. I do now. Now it's just a matter of sliding in our media drives. So to mount the uh, CF card adapter, I printed up this cool little bracket, but unfortunately I didn't take into account that's really high right there. So it won't fit. It won't fit underneath the floppy drive. The IDE cable runs into it. So it's not a big deal. I'll See if I can't design something a little better for that. Maybe lower it down. Um, give it a few more millimeters of room. But for now, we'll just mount it to the one of these PCI brackets back here. No big deal. Just zip this top one out of here. Won't be as convenient coming out of the back there, but uh, for now, it'll have to do. Um, we'll design something better to stick it up front. Well, we didn't get too far into cable management before we ran into a snag, because of course we did. So, we gotta come from here. We're gonna run this CD-ROM as a slave. I don't want too many cables in here. And it doesn't reach. It doesn't reach. 
but I think I have an extension, so I'll be right back. Well, I found my extension, and that is absolutely a thing of nightmares. Uh, let me see what I can do. In order to plug the floppy drive cable in, which is really short, it's only about, I don't know, 8 or 10 inches long, we have to move the CD-ROM drive from the lowest one to, I'm going to put in the highest one, um, expansion bay, because uh, the middle seems weird. So that's what I'm going to do. So we got to twist these blanks off of here. I never liked how... You, you still find these on new cases. I don't understand them. Oh, they're a pain. Cable management on a case like this, pretty much non-existent. There's, there's nowhere to tuck anything, and IDE ribbon cables are... <laughs> I forgot how kind of terrible they are for trying to have any semblance of order. So what I'm probably going to do is order a few of those cables that are sheathed, and maybe it'll look a little bit better. Um... Before I put the case shroud on, I noticed when we booted it up earlier to test it, the CPU fan wasn't spinning. So we're going to see if there's an option for that in the BIOS, because with a little bit of searching around online, I saw a picture of this motherboard with a fanless um, heat sink and, and uh, a fanless heat sink on the CPU. So maybe there's an option in the BIOS to turn that on. So here we go, first official boot, everything's plugged in, everything's hooked up, let's cross our fingers. The battery's probably dead. Yep, the battery's dead. 1990. Well, our CF card is detected. That's good. See if the fan is on. Can't really see. Let me get a flashlight. Uh, it's not on yet. Okay, I think we're going to end the video here. We got it fully put together. Everything seems to be working, minus the CPU fan, but I'm sure we can figure that out. Next time we'll install an OS, run some tests, maybe benchmark some games, and see if this can outperform my original or first PC, the Pentium 150. I'm pretty sure it can. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and maybe throw me a subscription. If you didn't, go ahead and give me a thumbs down. Either way, it really helps.